Today is May 21st, 2017, and uh, it's just a little bit after dawn. I had to get up here quickly because the winds are going to start howling. <laughs> I'm at 9,400 feet in the Colorado Rockies. Uh, the sun it would have raised over Pikes Peak over there had there not been some clouds. And Colorado Springs is just beyond there. This direction is north, and right off the edge of this bedrock outcrop of Colorado pink pegmatite, more than a billion years old, this rock, right off the edge here is a relict population of Engelmann spruce. And we've been up in this area staying in the home of a friend of ours, oh, for about five, six weeks now. And this is the only place where I found Engelman spruce. It's on a north facing slope. Engelman spruce requires very cold temperatures. Uh, so the spruce and subalpine fir are the highest trees that go up before you get to the alpine zone in the Colorado Rockies. Everything else around here is something other than spruce. And there's a little population here. So I'm recording this video as part of the climate series that I'm doing in forestry uh, because it's already a relict population. That means it used to be a bigger population around here back when it was colder and it's already shrunk down and so this is baseline documentation. Now episode 5 and its subseries began three years ago, 2014. I gave a talk in Durango, Colorado, uh, west of here, about 10 species of conifers in Colorado that were terribly threatened by climate change. Engelman spruce was one of them. Right here, I've seen a total of seven species of conifer trees, including Engelman spruce, and I'm going to have a few other episodes in this Rocky Mountain Trees in Climate Peril series showing baseline documentation of where they're living now here again so that somebody can come back in a few decades and use this spot right here to ascertain how the changes in climate are affecting trees. Now the reason that this area is so good right here for doing this is that it's absolutely amazing that because of this bedrock formation and the dryness of this area that there are so many microclimates. Right off the edge here is the south facing slope. We've got bristlecone pine down there. We've got pinyon pine. We've got some Rocky Mountain juniper coming in. Uh, and yet off of here, we've got spruce. So we have the microclimate showing up because of this geology. Five years later, it's February 2022, and I'm recording this in southern Michigan, uh, putting together my clips from five years ago in order to be able to do a little more baseline documentation and also to introduce a concept from a new forestry paper published last year, 2021, by James Worrell and Jerry Rayfelt on topoclimate. And that is, if you're trying to make projections of where you're going to lose trees and where they might be able to go to, if you can get them there, it's called assisted migration, uh, you can't just take a look at a grid that's so large that it obscures the topography within each of the grid sections. And more than obscuring the scale of the topography in there, uh, what really matters is what's called aspect. And that is what direction does a slope face? And that's what you're going to see in here. It's called topoclimate, topography, uh, climate, the heat from latitude, height, and aspect. Whether the, you're on a north-facing slope where it's colder or a south and especially southwest-facing slope, you're going to see, in particular here, you're going to see bristlecone pine really getting big and favoring the southwest facing slopes, very dry areas, uh, where nobody is competing with it. That's its biggest problem. It can grow very cold, 
very dry, but it tends to be outcompeted by other trees. And bristlecone pine, Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine, I'll show you the maps later, and I'm going to have a section at the end uh, with some more footage just on bristlecone pine, not the other six species of conifers, just bristlecone pine. Uh, but you're going to be able to see uh, how small its range is, and also that it's already up so high when you have climate change warming things going up, how do you move back downhill in order to get through the valley to get to the next northward set of mountains uh, in order to keep moving poleward? Very easy here in Michigan for trees to do that. We don't have topography in the way. As long as you've got some seeds, you've got somebody to disperse you, birds, winds, whatever, you're going to move. Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine, that's not the case for. Of the seven conifers, that's the one that's going to need humans to help it move north. So here's the paper by James Worrell and Gerald Rayfeld published last year. Here you'll see the title. Uh, you'll see where it was published. And I'm going to put it overlay a picture that was taken in 2016 where I finally got to meet Jerry Rayfeld. He was the one who was involved with Nick Crookston, um, and I'll show this right here now, involved with Nick Crookston on putting together for 76 tree species in the American West, uh, making computer modeling based on IPCC range projections of how the 76 native species of trees in Western North America uh, where they were going to need to move to, that is where their uh, ranges might shift. I'll show some more at the end about that and how that compares bristlecone pine with the other six species. So let's continue now, five years ago, 2017, back at 9,400 feet in uh, Colorado, and here's the little survey that I did, all within about a five-minute walk of that same elevation, 9,400 feet. Here's the survey that I did of finding seven conifer tree species, plus some aspen, um, right at that level, all dependent on aspect. So you really have to be on site in order to see the microclimates where trees as distinct as pinyon pine, which grows hot farther elevation down, and Engelmann spruce, the highest, coldest, and yet there they can be within a one minute, me walking from a southwest facing side to a north facing side. So again, baseline documentation, enjoy. May 18th, a climate weirded jet stream has brought us quite a snow. That's a Douglas fir here. This little one right here is a pinyon pine. Uh, we got a little ponderosa there. We've got a limber pine right there, and right next to it here is another ponderosa. But the reason I'm taking this picture is I am going to walk from this little pinyon pine. I'm going to swivel around and I am going to walk to the most coldest adapted of the seven conifer trees here, over to the north facing side of this big rock wall structure here. So just bear with me here. We'll take a little beauty rest on the way. Gorgeous ponderosa pine. Here's another view of the rock wall coming in. Look at the bonsai shape that this ponderosa pine takes. It's a limber pine right up above me here, but the ponderosa pine takes uh, very close to where it gets windy much of the time. Well, 
That's a Douglas fir. Ah, there they are. There they are. You can see growing right next to that pear. It's a pear spruce. It's a liver pine in front, growing right against that north-facing wall. So there you can see just a couple minutes to walk from the most cold adapted of the conifer trees here at 9,400 foot elevation and getting over to, on the other side, south facing side, that small pinion pine. So back to that little pinion pine right in the center low there. So what we've just seen, four species of conifer, pinion pine, ponderosa pine, limber pine, oh, Douglas fir, and spruce. That's five species of conifer, all right, right around here. And for me to get to the other two, that uh, rock structure in the background, easy to get there from a ridge, uh, right on this side of it here, kind of on a southwest facing area, very steep, uh, are two young bristlecone pines. And there's an intermediate ridge in between here uh, where I found three or four Rocky Mountain junipers, none of them very big. Uh, but you can see that's seven species of conifer trees all within just a few minutes walk of one another from this 9,400 foot ridge top where this house was built. So I'm walking over, a very easy walk from the house, over to this rock structure where I'm going to specifically find the two uh, individuals of bristlecone pine. Stopped for a beauty moment here under this ponderosa pine with the uh, characteristic orange bark on the mature age groups. Here's a cone. All right, let's go find those bristlecone pines. So I've come to the southwest facing side of this rock structure. And there are two bristlecone pines here. Let me zoom in on the first one. We'll take a look at it in a moment because I'm standing by the other one. I think a total of seven, maybe eight. I've found in various places over the past five weeks or so of exploring around here. Always on the lookout for bristlecone pine. Here's the other one. And it's definitely got that bristlecone pine shape, different from a limber pine. But it's also a five needle, just like limber pine is a five needle. And uh, the way that you tell for sure what it is, is that you get away from the snow area here. And let's see if I can find a spot where it's easy to see the white flecks of sap uh, that are on the little branchlets. It's a little harder to see it here with the snow because you might think it's moisture, but I've, I've I've been to this bristlecone pine several times before it started to snow, and this is. Here's a couple examples of, I think it takes three years for its cones to grow and ripen. First of all, there's one, a very young cone, right under there, and the scales have bristles on it. There, that's a good view. You can also see some of the white flecks on the needles. And then there's a 
mature cone and I always see the, the yellow sap on the mature cones and I don't think I really see that on the closest relative limber pine but again limber pine cones and bristlecone pine cones are so different. Starting to sleet again a little bit. We're supposed to get maybe six more inches of snow. I bet these aspens won't have any trouble shedding the snow. It's only gotten down. I think it's the coldest it's going to get is 24 degrees, so that's not very cold. So let's go, and uh, I'll turn off the video to do it, but we're going to be heading towards that other bristlecone pine. And here it is. I don't need to get a close-up of it. I just want to show where it is growing right from the base of that rock. And we're still in the aspen grove here, clonal aspen grove. Uh, what's surrounding it here is a pretty tall Juniperus communis, another conifer, uh, Juniperus genus, Juniper genus. But this one always stays low and in an immature form of leaf structure. In fact, let me uh, zoom in on that at the moment here. This looks kind of like, sort of like spiky triangular needles. All of the junipers, their young, start off this way and then they turn into more scale-like structures, characteristic of juniper. But you can see how easy this one, basically, this one just decided evolutionarily to stay immature and basically never de develop a leader, so it's always just vegetatively cloning out along the ground. Uh, my sense of it is, is it doesn't reroot. It, uh, y y you go in and you find the major stems, and golly, uh, golly, I'm sure, I'm sure this is older than I am. Here comes the sun. Let's take a little scan around here. So it's probably about 10 in the morning here, and the sun is directly behind me now. And the direction I came from, it's all fogged in now, but it's uh, right over the, in there, and it took me maybe, oh, five, ten minutes to walk from the spruce and little pinion, less than ten minutes, five minutes, uh, over to here. So the only one of the seven conifers that I haven't yet shown this morning, uh, the only place I've seen it, there have been three specimens on a lower ridge that goes between the ridge I'm on now and what we call Acorn Ridge over there. So here's a better view of the ridge I was just looking at, I called Acorn Ridge because See that rock formation? Ooh, here comes in the fog. Sure looks like an acorn to me. Now, down there looks like a gully, but there's actually two gullies with a small ridge uh, in between the two. And it's on that small ridge where I found all three specimens of Rocky Mountain juniper, actually four, um, and haven't seen them anywhere else. But with this snow, it's just too dangerous for me to go down there, so I'm going to put in uh, some pictures that I took uh, from about a week ago down there of the Rocky Mountain juniper specimens, and that will make our seventh and final conifer tree species all within five minute walk of one another, except I have to walk pretty slowly down there. So let's say 10 minutes, um, because that's a, a bit dangerous heading down there. I have to go down to some uh, bedrock formations and the very slippery um, Colorado pink pegmatite just erodes into these pebbles. And if it's on a hard surface, you can really go. And there's just one more set of outliers. Here I am back on top of the uh, bedrock outcrop. I just filmed down in the 
against this north facing and northeast facing wall here. The house is up there, just a couple minute walk away. Well, look at these right up here. Engelman spruce dwarfed. Look at that one there. I'll show a close up. Actually, I'll show of a cone. Three years ago when I was up here during the summer, it was forming some purple cones over that. And you'll be able to see how old that is. I'm sure that tree is older than I am. I'm 65. That is an ancient tree. So Engelman spruce does have the capacity to be able to bonsai a bit if it needs to. We're on the sliping uh, north slope here that then brilliantly cuts off right in that area. There's one little spruce there, one spruce here, one spruce here, and that's a limber pine. I'll uh, paste in some other video I've taken just of the rest of this dome area here. Everything that I've seen, they're not as big as this, but that's still alive is a limber pine, and you'll see some dead uh, skeletons here of other trees that were also trying to make a living up here, uh, and I assume those were limber pine. What's very successful here is Juniperus communis, and you'll see that growing in places where water collects. Here's another example. Next, a short section where I introduce all seven conifer species again, uh, samples of them, the leaves and the cones on a tablecloth, um, and where I talk about it. Now I'm talking about that this is a year before my snow time survey in May. And so there's one species that I had only seen that one little sample of up near the house, which didn't have cones on it. So I didn't know what it was at the time. Uh, but later on surveying, when I went down slope towards the saddle for about 300 feet lower down, I did see a couple more, just a couple more examples of older ones, still small, but they had cones. So I could definitively identify uh, the little pinion pine, not thinking it could be a lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pines, I didn't see any they, there, uh, but they do also grow up very high, uh, below the spruce zone typically. But anyway, here it is, a chance to look again at the cones and the leaf structures while I talk over it a year earlier, so that's six years ago. Ponderosa pine, a pine that has three needles um, stuck together in a, in a sheath. Three-needled pine, dominant pine of the Rockies, particularly at lower elevations. Limber pine, a lot of specimens of this up here. This is one of the five-needled pines that grow high up in the Rocky Mountains, limber pine. Engelman spruce, Engelman spruce. Douglas fir looks kind of similar to Engel Engelman spruce, uh, but its cones are very different. The cones, when you see them, they always have this threefold bract on them. Here's a young cone starting to form this year. Douglas fir, a lot of some very gigantic specimens up here. It just amazes me how it grows in a, such an arid zone. Two species of juniper here, juniperus, the one on the right is Rocky Mountain juniper. It's got two seeds within the berries. The one on the left is juniper, juniperus communis. Uh, it's just a spreading dwarf shrub uh, that survives underneath the snow. You only find it in shady areas. You don't find it where it's really exposed to the sun. Over here, We've got bristlecone pine, bristlecone pine. It also has five needles, grows very high up, 
But what's diagnostic is when you look at the underside of the needles, they've got these white specks of resin, bristlecone pine, just two specimens up here. And just one specimen of the only two needle pine that I've seen up here. It's only about two feet tall. Uh, this is probably a lodgepole pine, but possibly a pinion. I don't know. No cones on it, obviously, so I couldn't tell. So these are the species of conifers that I found all within a few hundred yards of one another here at 9,400 feet in the Rocky Mountains west of Colorado Springs of this many because of the diverse habitats and the ridges and valleys of this geological landscape, all kinds of microclimates. Now there was an eighth conifer tree that I did find there just to walk, but it's about a 90 minute walk, both to the north and to the south. Blue spruce. It's not only at lower elevations, but it tends to be pretty close to the bottom of a ravine, a creek. It needs moisture there. And this picture here, you'll see a couple of the branches that I collected and the cones. Both are diagnostic from the Engelmann versus the blue spruce. The blue spruce is not only bluer than the Engelmann, uh, but when you're touching the needles, they tend to come out more at a 90 degree angle. So when you go like this along the branchlet, uh, ugh, the blue spruce really prickles. The Engelmann is coming out more at a uh, smaller angle. And so when you go like this through the branchlet, it doesn't hurt your hands. Uh, you can see the cones are different too. Blue spruce cones are not only about twice the size of Engelmann cones, but they're a lighter color and they're sort of a beige brown. The Engelmanns are sort of a dark reddish brown, so very easy to distinguish the two. Now I'm going to show you a map here. Um, I did find sun to the north of the house that has the blue dot there. Uh, but really heading down towards the southeast side of the ridge, down through the aspens and continuing on down. And this spruce, this was the first one, that I, and I was just like, what is it doing here? Look how huge it is. Uh, there were no other smaller blue spruce around it, though certainly to the left downhill towards the creek, I would have been able to find some more if I went down there. There must have been some sort of an underground, uh, easy to tap water source for its roots there. But isn't that a remarkable tree? The eighth conifer tree within about a 90 minute walk of the house where we were staying. Now it's time to go in depth with bristlecone pine. And you'll see here how much I love this conifer species. Partly because it is unusual, it's rare, you have to go up to higher locations to find it, you just don't find it around Denver. Uh, but also, it is the best smelling leaves when you just put your nose right up to it. Gorgeous smell. So, during the snow scene, the place where I showed the two very close together bristlecone pines are where that white asterisk is. Now, I'm going to show you some footage of three other locations where I've also seen bristlecone pine. Uh, first one I'll show is up and to the left. There's actually a pass that goes, or a trail that goes down from the house, maybe 300 feet, 400 feet or so, heading towards that other dome to the left there. I'll show some footage of that. Next, we're going to go down to, to the right, that's to the east. We're going to go down that really amazing aspen clone gully that goes down. And you'll see a white asterisk there where I found two specimens of bristlecone growing right in the aspens, right in there. Very tall, that kind of tall columnar shape to it. If I were to continue down that gully, that's where the blue asterisk of the blue spruce was. The final place, I don't have video, I just have still photos of, but this is where the giant ones were found.
very close to the house, a little difficult to get down to. Southwest facing slope. So the video footage will start at the asterisk in the upper left there. Again, that's actually about 300 feet, maybe 400 feet down slope of the house and the yellow dot where I was recording all the snow. That is a pass, and here's a photo I took where I'm far to the north and I'm looking back south where you can see that beautiful curved pass there. Uh, the rock that I had recorded, all the snow stuff, was to up that to the left. The house is to the left of that. And the other dome is to the right. But right on that pass, kind of right towards the center of it, that's where my husband and I, Michael Dowd, spotted a couple bristlecone pines growing with some living and dead aspens. So I don't know what's going on there, but they're pretty young. I just came from that big dead stump in the middle there. You see some other ones logging. And I stopped right here because look who we have right in the center of the picture there. Bristlecone pine, unmistakable in the branching. And then, of course, the cones are very, very different from the closest relative of the limber pine. So there's one of the cones. Look at those bristles standing out. And uh, diagnostic uh, little white specks. I'll move up here a little bit just to show the other cones. And moving up. Today, I think, is May 17th, and this is only the fifth or sixth bristlecone pine I've found in all my wanderings thus far. I keep a special eye out for these. Very easy to spot. Here's the context. Just turning around here. Limber pine there, Douglas fir, a lot of aspen. So yeah, that stump should be here for a while, so that'll be a, a good way to landmark to look to see how well this bristlecone pine is surviving. Got a little shade. It's on the north facing side of this beautiful living aspen tree. And here's a ponderosa pine. Three needles in its fascicles, though there are a couple that fooled me that are just two. You can see it has cones on it. And there on the far left is the bristlecone pine that I was just at. Nothing else is shaped like that. Even when it gets pure sun like that, it still decides to go up like a telephone pole. And I just came from down there a short ways and look at what, look at what I found. Another bristlecone pine. Now this is a two stem, so this one should be easy to find again. This one doesn't have uh, any cones on it, but there's quite a few old ones under it. And we've got limber pines on both sides of it. Well, we've got a young Douglas fir here, but here's a limber pine over here. And I'm going to rotate around. Just uphill is a beautiful, healthy limber pine here. Another one just behind it as well. And I gathered two cones on the right from the bristlecone pine uh, underneath it and this limber pine. It's the most diagnostic of all next to, well, just as much as the Douglas fir. Hard to tell in this picture. Let me go close up here. They kind of look like baskets, you know, each of the scales. They're very thick. And over here, Let's see if you can see any of the 
Yeah, you can see some of the bristles. You can see some of the bristles on those cones, the scales. So that was young bristle cones at the saddle area northwest of the house. Now we're going to move down to the white asterisk southeast of the area. That's a beautiful gully in there, very flat bottomed, easy to walk through, and probably the most extensive and healthiest aspen forest that I've ever experienced. Let's see what we find. Look who is right here besides my husband. I, up here, I looked at this and I said, the shape of this tree looks to me like a bristle cone, not a limber pine. And it's validated here. Validated. Michael, talk to us about how you know. Got all these little spots, little white spots that you don't have on a limber pine. Right. Going up. Bristle cone pine. Look at this. This is entirely an aspen forest with just a few Douglas firs here. This is only the third bristlecone pine I've found around this area, and this is certainly the lowest one and the shadiest one. And here's a look through the aspen forest. This is the bottom of the gully. We've gone quite a ways down, and it's no flowing water, just grass and leaves and this beautiful aspens. But where Michael stopped to take a rest in the shade by this boulder, I looked and I said, I'm not sure that that's a limber pine. Turns out it's a bristle cone. Let me go up there a little bit. Uh, here, you can see coming out from underneath the boulder. Wow. And then there's a couple of its cones there. And let's see, I think I have to walk out to here to get to the, again, the needles with the white flex on them. Here, here's a good one. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, yeah. See the white flex? See if I get another one here. Oh yeah, look at those white flecks. Diagnostic of bristle cone. Plus it has kind of a strange shape, but I thought it might just be a limber pine that's being a little stressed by this rock and be, well, I'll have to move this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see? Here we go. There it is. What a beauty. Bristle cone pine. And I'll finish moving that off to the side. Right by a boulder and here's the easy to walk through young aspen forest. Grassy base. So now we come to the final section. A southwest facing slope probably at about 9,300 feet elevation, just 100 feet down, if that, from where the house is. A number of trees, different ages, but every single one that we saw was taking the more rounded, expansive, splaying stance than the columnar ones that we found growing with aspens. These were out there on their own, southwest facing. Uh, some of them down where there were some Douglas fir as well, but the biggest one that you will see at the end here is on a little shelf all by itself. It's taken the whole area and it's got quite a bit of water spilling off of rock alongside it there. So this was the beautiful stand of bristlecone pine, exactly where you would expect to find them. I'm going to close out this video with some maps to bring back the concept of topo climate aspects in uh, very rugged topography, but also to give it some grounding to show the significance of what it means if you've got a tree species like bristlecone pine that's already ventured up mountain slopes 
topographically complex areas. And that as climate changes, how's it going to keep heading forward if it can't move back downward before it goes up the next? Is it doomed? Or is it doomed without some human help? That's the question that I'll get to at the end. But first, let's take a look at the two species of bristlecone pine in the United States. The one that we're looking at is Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine in Colorado. And then to the west, there's another species called Great Basin bristlecone pine. And that's the one you may have heard of that's got those enormously uh, high elevation, windswept, looking nearly dead bristlecone pine trees that are very, very old. In contrast, let's take a look at the maps of the native ranges where the other conifer species we've been talking about in this video, where their native ranges are, how vast they are. So we'll start with Engelmann spruce, Douglas fir. Now notice for Douglas fir that there are actually two species. There's one in the west, uh, that's the one that we're used to, that mixes with redwood trees. It's on the Olympic Peninsula, giant, but requires moist conditions. And there's one in the Rocky Mountains. This is the one we've been seeing in this video. And they can persist in really dry areas, but up high in the mountains. Another one is Ponderosa pine. And you see in the colors here that there's a, var a variety of different kinds. I don't know if they're species or subspecies, but it's very widespread and it's got different adaptations for different parts of the North American continent. Limber pine. This one's not as widespread as some of the others. And as you know, it's already up slope of the mountains. Take a look at Rocky Mountain Juniper. We had just a couple examples I showed you as it's usually uh, lower down on the slopes of mountains where I was in Colorado, uh, but very widespread. And look how far north it goes up into Canada. And then pinyon pine, lots and lots of it, but over a very small, relatively small area uh, in the desert southwest, pinyon pine. Okay, back to our set of two species of bristlecone pine. Now let's focus on just the Colorado species of bristlecone pine. And recall the project that I introduced at the beginning of this video, uh, in which U.S. Forest Service researchers, Jerry Rayfelt was one of them, used the IPCC projected climate scenarios, 2030, 2060, 2090, for 76 species of trees in the western USA, possibilities for how their ranges would contract and shift well, let's use the maps from that climate model to see what the projections could be for future climate. So here we begin with the current. And the arrow points to the site where I filmed at 9,400 feet here in Colorado. But notice in the lower left the key there. That red signifies the highest viability score. That is the best places right now. Uh, for bristlecone pine of the Rocky Mountain variety to persist. Green is not as good, but still, okay, probably survivable. So, let's take a walk into the future. Here's 2030. Here's the projection for 2060. And here's the projection for 2090. Okay, you can see my concern. This is why I'm concerned about bristlecone pine, and other people are too. Again, this is just an overview at a very large scale of how range contraction could happen. And of course, there'd be microsites in there where um, some of the species could hold on. But nonetheless, it gives us a sense that bristlecone pine, Rocky Mountain bristlecone pine, of all those other conifer species, is the one that's likely to be very much in trouble. It can't head back down the slope in order to start heading poleward again. It's going to need human help to do that. And that's called assisted migration. And so the reason that I feel very comfortable 
supporting that for Briscombe Pine is 20 years ago in my 2001 book, The Ghosts of Evolution. I had a, a, a subsection in there where I mentioned that a U species, family taxaceae, called Florida terrea, terrea taxifolia, that it being a glacial relic that had been stuck down in its peak glacial range when there was ice all over Michigan, where I am right now, uh, probably floated down the river to get down there, and it never made it back. It stuck down there, stopped reproducing 60 years ago. I mean, it's in trouble, okay? So I proposed that we humans move it. And for 20 years, close to 20 years, 15 years ago, we citizens actually started moving it. It's very controversial because it's an endangered species and the officials are not willing to move it. So we started moving it as citizens and we found ways to do it legally. But you can see there's another species of Terea, genus Terea, Terea californica, and look at the dots out there. That means that it's a mountain species out there too, very likely to top out at some point, like bristlecone pine, and it's going to need humans to move it. And so I'll now paste in over the top of that on the home page of TereaGuardians.org. This is what you'll see as the image of assisted migration. You'll see the peak glacial refuge and where we've already not only been planting with volunteers, planting trees on private property, but where we've actually started getting seed production in Cleveland, Ohio, of a Florida species that hasn't been able to reproduce in Florida since about 60 years ago. Too many diseases uh, attacking it. It, just, it can't handle the diseases in Florida anymore. The climate's already too warm. So if you're interested in learning what trees you might be able to help cope with climate change by helping them move north, you can visit my Climate Trees and Legacy webpage. And you'll also find all those videos right here on YouTube under my Ghosts of Evolution channel name. And now I'll close out this video in my usual way. May the forest be with you.